I want to talk about the evolution of web application architectures. Um, this talk is, uh, is will show maybe talk a little bit about um, the nature of code, but really this is about understanding how web applications have evolved in our architecture, just as the web has evolved from a document serving to application serving platform. Um, this will cover in you know 15, 20 minutes a a 15 plus year history of doing that so obviously it'll be very quick um, but I want to specifically point out some of the pros and cons and, and reasoning behind the evolution of these web app application architectures as that's going to lead into why we're doing Node.js and then eventually why we're going to do browser-based programming. So in a sense this is a very important 15-20 minutes in that this helps you understand the trajectory of web application um, uh, which is the underlying kind of theme, conceptual framework, if you will, theme of this course. So with that, let's jump into it. Um, you can see in the title slide, I'm talking about legacy, which means talk about older things. Hopefully you recognize these four images. Um, uh, if you don't, maybe the lower left one might get you, um, uh, but the rest of them you might recognize as 90s style icons from when, uh, and that's when the web and the dynamic web first started coming about. So, the web evolved, uh, as we talked about, initially as a document serving platform, but initially there was this need, I mean, people early on, I should say, recognized this need to have dynamic content introduced. Now, back then we didn't have JavaScript, you know, we didn't, you know, we had some hack together tags, like a blink tag to try and make things interactive, but the, the web was passive. It was serving HTML documents, um, you know, rendered in these browsers and it brought in some images and, you know, and, and so forth to try and make it um, interactive. It wasn't multimedia, it wasn't video in the early days, it wasn't audio. But if folks want to do something dynamic, right, in terms of generating dynamic content, in some personalized way, that was one use case. The second was processing input, right? If I wanted to use a form or collect information from end users for some business purpose, um, I needed a way to process the information um, that folks were inputting. Now, HP didn't say, doesn't say anything about this, right? The protocol doesn't say anything, anything about um, what the web server has to do with the response. It's an it's a network protocol. Um, so basically, you know the the interpretation of HTTP and what somebody did was still kind of the wild, wild west, all right? Um, as folks started to recognize the need from this web server just serving up um, uh, documents out on the file system, right? Just grabbing some document and writing it back as HTML. And they started to realize the need for um, dynamic behaviors and personalized content. The first thing they came up with is something called a common gateway interface or CGI. Um, CGIs are not scripts, they are fully executed programs. So what this diagram is supposed to demonstrate to you is if I've got in a request that mapped to a right the path on my server underneath a particular directory configurable by uh, the, uh, the web server software, whichever one you were using, um, it would point to an executable program and what the web server would do is it would fork this blue, big blue area here this is a fork or a spawn of a new process so you'd literally start up a whole new program which was this one this myapp.cgi because that's what we're recognizing here and that myapp.cgi would have its the overhead of an entire runtime environment right and when it executed it had to generate some output via what's called its standard out right Typically, you think of standard out as going to the screen. Here, standard out is captured and sent back all the way to the browser. Right. So there's some implications here um, uh, that are well. There's some good things, but there's also some bad things. Um, here's a quick example. Here's an example of a test.cgi. It is this many lines of Perl code. Um, all it does is echo out all the environment variables in the running process. Right. That's what percent %m does uh, in a Perl script. Now, this is outputting, if you if you inspect these uh, environment variables, you see a whole bunch of things that would come with even a, a shell I'd start up um, in my terminal window on my computer. Um, but you also see things that are very specific, like the query string, like different HP user agent, there's our cache control, there's our accept, things like that, um, and accept car set. These things are all um, web specific, HP specific. So the environment variables, which were a way of passing information to well, two from the web server to the running program um, were a combination of the standard environment variables that came from any new program that's running combined with things that the CGI defined would get passed automatically to that running program. And for that reason, you could get dynamic information and generate some dynamic content. All right. Now, what happened with these uh, CGIs? Let me use some white space here. Um, some some good things about it, right? The, the main 
uh, there were there were a couple benefits to CGI's. One of them is is at the time, right? At the time, there was no other way to do dy dynamicity. There's no other way to, to dynamically generate something and write it to the screen. Everything else was static HTML files or static something file, plain files, and so there was no other way. You could you could reuse your legacy content if you had an HTML transformer on the server side, or if you had it as plain or something like that. But you couldn't dynamically do anything unless it was a CGI. Um, was a good thing. The second thing is, is I could take legacy programs um, and put them on the web. Now, I mean, you know, I'm just showing a simple example here, outputting a bunch of environment variables. But realize, folks had an entire investment in in lots of code running on mainframes, running on local uh, area network servers, and so forth that could do different business operations, and they wanted to reuse that code. It could be C code, it could have been COBOL code, it could be any number, right? And and they didn't want to just throw all that away to write it for this new web platform. Since CGI's can basically execute any running program. Um, by forking a new process, it, I mean, with some work, just a little bit of work to get the HTML out and the mark out, up out that you want to go to a browser, um, you could basically reuse an awful lot of existing code. Um, and that reuse made it faster, right? Uh, application, uh, the web is application platform to evolve faster. So these were two pros. These were two benefits. Some of you might tell you why CGI's, they were, they were good for nothing. Well, at the time, they were the only way to do something dynamic, and they provided a relatively quick path for reusing existing code that was not in, originally intended for the web. Some cons, though, right? First con, and this is the biggest con. I want you to be aware of this. A big increase in runtime um, um, slowdown, or maybe I should write this as a big decrease in runtime. Um, let me write the arrow the other way: a decrease in runtime performance. Now, why is that? Well, remember we talked about HP is is synchronous, so when you made a request, you'd wait for the response. So what that meant is, as you make a request in here you had to wait to fork a process, the operating system had to set up the entire runtime environment, get the result back, marshal that back through another process and out over a network thing. So I used a lot of resources, all right, so I used um, more resources of the computer, which limited scalability, and I was slower because I had to set up and tear down of a whole process at the operating system level. That's the, the biggest problem with CGI. They just, they will not scale. All right. Other problems. A um, tight coupling to markup. So there was some things that, you know, we could reuse code, but the problem was is we also had to take code and turn around and make it generate markup, which, it, you know, it didn't generate HTML originally. So now you had all kinds of, of tricks and ways to try and take legacy code or rewrites just to get it to output markup instead of something else, right, HTML markup. Um, because when the CGI runs, as soon as you delegate, as soon as you delegate to this thing right here, and I know I'm making a mess of this, but as soon as you delegate to that, um, it takes over the entire standard output. So you can't use any combination of static files or anything. You've, your CGI now has to become HTML aware and rewrite the whole thing. Okay. Um, the third one was security. You can write, run any program. That should scare you. That program is going to run with the same um, security privileges as the web server. So now I've got a problem. Now I may have a security problem if I have some rogue program, poorly coded program, or somebody can take control of my server um, indirectly somehow um, and, and get and inject a Trojan horse or something like that. Right? Anything executing a full-blown process at the operating system level, um, who knows? Does that thing go and delete your entire file system um, or other risks like that? So, have they died of a uh, painful death? Well, yes and no. I mean, I don't see new CGI's developed. None of none of my industry contacts or professional partners talk about writing CGI's anymore. Haven't for many years. However, there's a lot of legacy code out there, right? So yesterday's shiny new code, tomorrow's legacy code, and I still see um, several CGI's from time to time as I go around the web um, uh, being used, which means somebody somewhere is maintaining that. Um, again. Um, to summarize, HP is originally a document-serving protocol only. CGI was introduced as a quick and dirty way, a hack, 
um, to get web pages to be um, dynamic and interactive. So folks kind of went ballistic. They started writing tons of these CGIs without thinking about maintenance going forward. Some newer, better architectures uh, started to come about. So originally when Netscape formed as a server-side company and put out their own version of the open source NCSA HP server with extensions, they extended it with something called the Netscape API, the NS API, so you could write a server-side plugin to generate content. There's a servlets we'll talk about in a minute. There was the Apache mod process for this implicit invocation style. So better architectures uh, fairly rapidly came about within the next few years. Um, some folks who understood some of the problems CGI started hacking servers um, to come up with new things. So, for example, Open Market created a pseudo standard, meaning it wasn't an endorsed standard by a standards body, but a very popular th um, practice that, f that the community of practice pointed to. Um, to try and get CGI's to work in a more common way so folks would have a, uh, a choice on the market. In other words, you wouldn't get tied to something like Netscape um, or something like an Apache mod handler or a proprietary way of doing a CGI um, because um, uh, a, a standard was starting to evolve. But it didn't really um, take off. It didn't, it, you know, you can still find it on the web, but um, I wouldn't say it got the, the amount of market share it really needed to do. Um, as a as an as a result of all this today, if you see servers running CGI's, they're running something usually called fast CGI, which is kind of an optimized architecture that actually tries to get around or prevent this forking of a new process. But again, fundamentally, I want you to remember that this forking of a new process was a big runtime hit, right? This this fork um, right here would just cut, be too expensive to do. Um, in order to, to be um, a sustainable, scalable solution for the web. So what happened next? Folks started looking at things called server-side includes, and eventually I'm going to bundle in here um, SSS or server-side scripting languages. In server-side scripting languages, what happens is you basically mix um, scripts and markup together, and you interpret the scripting parts that are embedded in the markup in the web server itself. So this SSI module would run within the same process space as the web server. Now it could fork a process, so it kind of subsumes CGI's and that you could fork a process, um, but you didn't have to use that. This is, this is optional over here. The architecture really is embedding this capability inside the same running process. All right. So um, this example here is from Apache. It shows in HTML comments, right? This is an HTML comment. It shows, for example, the forking of a process, right? Pound exec is a f uh, is is fork a process and do something capture the output, all right? But it also has other ones that are directives that are interpreted directly by the web server process. We have an echo. We have an if else block. We have a uh, a system command called f last mod um, that indicates what the the last modification time is. If you're on a Unix system, you can um, do that on the command line. And so Apache did this um, with, this is an example of their directive mod. This is back in the late 90s. We're talking 20 years ago. Um, but there, all of a sudden there was all kinds of folks doing their own. Um, there were, there were all, all kinds of um, uh, one-offs creating their, their own server-side scripting languages and taking the open source NCHV server and basically pulling it in all kinds of directions, doing their own uh, uh, their own solutions. I mean, nowadays, you, there's only a handful of uh, web servers that folks typically use. You hear about the, micro, the IES evolution. You hear about Apache. You hear about Nginx. Apache and Nginx uh, are probably the two most popular. Um, but back in the day, there would be everybody's variant of NCSA HTTP um, that they would take and pull in different directions, whether it was a commercial vendor like Netscape or, you know, Joe and Susie down the block in a garage doing it. Um, and very often, and they were folks who were also garage ISPs that would also come up with these capabilities for folks. And you'd sign up and they'd say, go use our proprietary server-side scripting language to put your business on the web. Um, and next thing you know, you're tightly coupled. You're tied to them, right? That was the big, um, de uh, that tight coupling by not maintaining good separation of concerns, which means coupling markup and logic, 
in the same file, um, difficult to maintain. Um, there could be security risks like CGI if the site's improperly configured because you could expose some of that business logic. And again, it was a lack of standards which, which led to all kinds of um, variants. There's also a degradation of server performance, if only because this thing is now embedded inside the server. The servers before were very simple. They just turned around and grabbed the file and wrote the contents out the out output stream. Um, so, so web servers originally could be very thin. Now they might be running a parser inside it that's looking inside the content um, and actually replacing the content dynamically uh, with the output of directives. And of course that requires some processing that requires um, certainly a parser. But there were benefits, all right? Um, simple dynamic tasks, right? Simple customization of content didn't require a full-blown program like a, like a CGI that took over the output. Um, servers could personalize. They can use information in the request, take specific actions, and again, do that in a way that's a lot simpler than that uh, environment variable approach I showed you with the CGI example. So it kept the clients thin and the servers fat. Even as scripting languages started to take hold in the browser, uh, which started happening in the late 90s as well, um, it was still a benefit to keep the server fat, doing the logic and the processing, because then we wouldn't have a platform dependence issue. I was only outputting straight HTML, right? This stuff, by the way, um, what, what I'm saying is this: all this stuff with these comments, you wouldn't see that in the browser, right? This all got parsed out. All these statements got parsed out. When you're over here in the browser window, if you did a view source in this, you wouldn't see any of that stuff because it was already taken out in the server before, right? It was taken out here. Um, as the request went in here and this did its processing, all those directives got taken out before we wrote back to, to the um to the browser uh, through the output stream. So all I would see is plain markup, right? So there wasn't a security risk there. Um, uh, what other thing, again, no, no security risk. So, you know, have these died a, a slow, painful death? Um, well, again, not really. I mean, um, and one might argue that's still actually the predominant programming model because one can put PHP with all those WordPress sites um, in the category of server-side scripts. That's what it effectively is. It's mi mixing PHP scripting and output of markup code in a intentionally tightly coupled way um, to build faster websites. And there's own, their own patterns for trying to maintain that. All right. Um, I already talked about uh, this story and use case, um, but again, there were some improvements. No separate process mentioned. Worked faster, um, uh, but our problem was tight coupling of things and this proliferation of platforms. Um, but again, for the right class of problems, one can argue that server-side scripts are still the simplest thing to do. Um, because too much decoupling and too many separations of con concerns can just make things more complicated and more difficult to maintain, right? Um, a quick note on something called Apache mod handlers. From a runtime perspective, mod handlers aren't a code structure, right? So some of the pros and cons I talk about with SSIs and with CGIs are code level, tight coupling, things like that. Others are runtime, right? Forking a new process, slowing down a server by embedding a parser. The Apache mod handlers are just the runtime part of that. And that basically worked by creating this implicit invocation style. How implicit invocation could work? Um, you know, this Hollywood principle, don't call us, don't call, we'll call you. What does that mean? It means you would write, um, you would take standard models written in the community or you'd write your own, right? And you could run them like mod PHP inside, again, the process space of the server. So we're still not forking a process. Um, but now I could take these uh, applications and basically register them into the server, the Apache core. And the Apache core would sit there and say, okay, based on certain events, all right, an event would be an incoming request. Could be other things, but usually it's an incoming HTTP request. And usually, again, by whatever the relative URL is when you get to the server, it would say, oh, I need to look at that event and send that off to the PHP one, for example. So maybe the server would be configured to take everything ending in .php, and that's an event that gets routed into this particular module. And that module runs again within the process space of the main web server. Yes, it boats the web server, but it does it in a more manageable plugin architecture and standard configuration is one. Um, and secondly, it is avoiding um, forking um, that extra uh, process that we found so computationally expensive for, um, uh, for CGIs.
right? So that, that was Apache mod handlers, a variant on the runtime. And, and, and Apache mod handlers are still there, and that's how most, there's an implicit invocation just about every modern web server now to extend the web server in a more structured way via this plugin, all right? And that plugin register itself, and there, so that's where the Hollywood principle comes in. The core has to know when to call that thing. Your mod doesn't call something. The core knows when to call you. Okay, things evolve, evolved then in, around the turn of the century, turn of millennium, um, into component container models. Um, the main models were, was, uh, you know, one was an evolution um, on the .NET platform, but really the first one that came up with this was the Java community and the servlet model. And the servlet model is still very popular today. Um, some folks consider it um, dated, um, but there's still probably more servlet development going on than anything else. Some of that has to do with the fact when you have an embedded technology and ingrained in the community, there's so many people trained on it that that's just the way they're used to working. Uh, others is, is there's frameworks built on top of Java servlets. You, you really don't write a raw servlet anymore. You write on top of framework and there's a very popular framework called Spring out there that is very popular for writing web applications um, and you know we'll, we'll stick around for a while because it's very popular but we'll talk about some of the pros and cons of this approach as well but the main thing about this one is in your web server there was a a running process that is a JVM that's the Java symbol there this is the Tomcat symbol by the way so this is the again the Apache community put out Tomcat which is still out today um, and what you would do is you would have one embedded running Java process one JVM and servlets were components that plugged into the framework the servlet framework um, and again kind of a Hollywood principle kind of way there was a way to configure those things so that it knew when to invoke your component right but since it's running inside a Java container the component container model, it meant that the Java process sticks around um, as do all its objects, which means now we had something directly stateful, right? So we talked about the statelessness of HTTP, right? What does stateless mean again? I'll let you recite the definition in your head. Um, but having each independent request like that meant for application programming, right? Every time I spun up, for example, in a CGI, a new program, right? Another, I'm going to go all the way back here. Another problem with CGI is way back here is, you know, after this app ran in the context of that one HP request, it went away, right? This runtime environment went away. Even if you hit the same CGI again, it had to start up all over again, which means it didn't keep anything stateful from the prior execution unless you wrote it out to non-volatile storage, which is, again, just another expense to do something. Whereas in Java, if I, in, in a, in a um, persistent JVM always running, if the servlet created some object, well, guess what? On the next request, that servlet could still access that same object because it didn't go anywhere. It's not bound to just the request response synchronous cycle of that H single HP request. Um, so that created some scalability type of things. And also servlets kind of um, evolved in a more orderly fashion. They weren't an international standard per se, but Sun at the time, now Oracle bought them out and Sun is no more. Um, but at the time they support, they still do, they support something called the JCP. And you can look this up, the Java Community Process. And they put servlets in there. So it was actually a specification you could go to. Um, and multiple vendors joined in that. And multiple vendors had to say what version of the servlet specification they were adhering to. Um, and that, that provided a way more orderly story to things than say the um, server-side scripting type uh, approach where we had all these uh, you know homegrown web servers taking the same code base and introducing all these variants all over the place um, however they wanted the same thing with CGI as a hacked interface even though there was documentation on what was supposed to be in a CGI it wasn't a, a formal standard this might have been a vendor standard but at least it was a standard and it was pretty well managed I should say by the Java community as well and you can look up you know there's Java docs on the APIs and the objects and all that stuff there's a PDF of the manual you can get online. They'll tell you exactly the kinds of things that the servlet vendors are obligated to do, and you as an application programmer, a servlet developer, are obligated to do as part of that contract. And if you don't do those things, it's not supposed to work. It's not supposed to be allowed. Here's an example in code. Right? I haven't showed you code yet, um, but simple example what a contract in Java code. And again, you should know Java coming into this class. So even though the APIs are foreign to you that come in packages like this, you should be able to read this code and get a sense. When you wrote a servlet, you extended. This is a 
um, built-in library class out of that package. That's part of the servlet specification. When you implemented that, then you were under contract to implement various do methods, one or more do methods. One of those was called do get for doing HTTP get requests. As you might think, there was a do post. Um, you get a, the framework would give you request and response objects. It would actually parse all the headers and information for you. You didn't have to do environment variables or anything else that was hokey. And you had nice APIs to set the headers yourself. Here's a response object setting the content for uh, uh, the uh, content type, for example, what we talked about in HTTP. Um, you could write to it just by using standard Java streaming API or writer APIs to write things out just like you write it out to the screen and embed the markup in there. All right, so you get an output stream and write out the output, and when you were done, this would this component would write things out back through. All right, this component, that code is what one of these blue S's are. So what would happen is again when we when we would map some URL to be handed off to the JVM, go through the Tomcat framework, it would decide which component it went through, execute that component, and write the stuff all the way back out. Okay. Now servlets are an example of container managed applications. And I'm not going to go through this in detail. Um, it, it's perhaps more architecture than we require for this class. But I do want you to be aware of what a component container architecture is. You, you really should have an idea already. But this container is the JVM. And these servlets are the components. Right? The orange boxes are what's called an application context in servlet land. right? And you could be running multiple contexts, multiple web applications in a single JVM process. Um, and you could be running multiple components within a with a single application context. Each of these nested boxes depended on services outside of it. So the servlet would have a scope where it depended on things coming from the application context. The application context had a contract with the JVM to do certain things. All right. So, for example, ser uh, part of the contract, servlets are singletons. What that means is no matter how many HTTP requests there are, every single servlet is instantiated as one object in the JVM no matter what. Um, servlets had to be thread safe, right? Because there's only one object in there, all those different requests that were coming in were basically mapped. All the requests that come in are mapped to each of their own thread. So this was a multi-threaded environment, which means they shared process resources. All right. Um, typically, you would pre-allocate the set of threads into a number of workers. In Tomcat, there's a configuration of that that I'll show you. Um, and each thread would then um, execute by going to the right component, the right servlet, and doing things like this. this what I'm saying is this class, uh, an instantiation of it, a one instantiation called date servlet existed in memory, and it would get all the threads running through it um, that corresponded to the right URL for the framework to map it down to this component. All right. Um, Java servlets at the time represented that next evolutionary step in web application architectures, right? We went from CGIs as a separate process, server scripts being embedded within the web server process, to the JVM being a separate stateful process that stuck around um, in a component container multi-threaded. So that threading and the pre-existing of this thread pool or workers um, is what gave it um, a lot of its scalability power. And, and servo, the servo frameworks done right are, ex are extremely scalable. High volume websites um, handle um, in this approach. Now there's some pros to this. There's a significant install base. There's still a lot of people out there using this technology. From a deployment perspective, they understand it. All right, um, And it's been shown, as I said, to scale, to be secure and to be heavily scalable. Now, there's some drawbacks to that, though. First of all, um, a lot of operations staff, meaning folks not trained as engineers. Um, I'm talking about network administrators, um, uh, system administrator types, always had a hard time supporting. When a defect happens in one of these platforms, component container, they can be very difficult to track down, very difficult to bug. It can be very difficult to to even un, um, understand the deployment architecture, meaning how many servers do you have to buy, where do they have to run, how many of these JVMs do you spin up, do you do it with one application per container or many per container, all kinds of capacity planning and performance testing you have to do to get it just right. And then if your traffic changes, you got to do it all over again. Um, the code itself, when at the coding level, can be very verbose and bloated, and if you sense boring, a lot of repetitive 
uh, code um, just to marshal data back and forth between um, uh, these servo components and the back-end functionality that they wanted to use. A lot of simple defects done because that code's boated. I mean, some of it was just, um, honestly, is it w was the problem with Java itself. Um, Java itself could be, um, uh, was responsible for that bloat, and there were some approaches for dealing with that. For example, folks started using a Java virtual machine, but would use something like Groovy on Grails, and something called um, convention over configuration to just try and reduce the code bloat and, and write more compact code. There was a Jython, a version of Python written to compile to Java bytecode. So folks liked the runtime environment, but there was a lot of Java hate going out there for how, how uh, verbose it was. And then it doesn't um, easily play well with a client-side focus. Um, that might have changed over time, but for a while, and we'll understand more when we go to client-side applications, um, applications kind of started to migrate functionality off the server um, into the client. And it didn't happen all at once. Now we're, well, now, now we're mostly client-centric, um, but it didn't happen all at once. And you'd migrate almost specific features um, down into the browser. And that was actually very difficult to refactor in your Java code. So the period of time from you know 2009, 2010, until 2015, 16, as folks were migrating applications to the client side, could be fairly painful for Java shops to deal with. All right, so to summarize, and, and again, um, you're not programming these things. Um, this is a very short uh, overview. It went longer than 15 to 20 minutes, but still a short overview of an awful, you know, tw 15 plus years of evolution um, motivating what we're going to do in, in Node.js again. So again, let's summarize. This common gateway interface, the original web hack, spawns a separate process. Right? It's evolved a bit architecturally, particularly at the runtime architecture, and there's a lot of legacy codes that are not fully dead yet. SSIs were dynamic little fragments embedded in a web server. JavaScript is largely eliminated to need to do any of this stuff, to tell you the truth. So even though I still see some CGIs out here, I, you know, I never see these out here anymore. However, you do see server-side um, languages and server-side um, scripting languages, particularly we talked about the PHP case, uh, there's others. Um, but again, this idea of, of handing um, embedded markup with code off to some kind of parser to mix in and render. In fact, Java even had something called JSPs, which they tried to call a server-side scripting language. They aren't really a server-side scripting language. It turns out they're cross-compiled to servlets. But the point being is that model of server-side scripting was so embedded and so popular coming out of communities like PHP that it still exists in various flavors, and there's still a lot of active development in it, to tell you the truth. Um, component container architectures, most notable be server, servlets, still quite popular, right? Quite criticized, but quite popular um, uh, because of the prevalence of technologies um, like Spring, of other frameworks. There's tons of these servlet-based frameworks out there. Um, huge install base, huge level of support, huge inv investment in um, capacity planning um, uh, to have these things work as well. Now, the world is going for various reasons to something that's a little more functional, lightweight, and more cloud-friendly um, uh, than servlet frameworks. But again, big install base. Um, it'll be still be around for some time, still quite popular today. Very scalable, but very heavy, both on your organization, your computational resources, can be very difficult to deploy and optimize because of the complexity of trying to create this big distributed component-based environment. Again, you get it just right. This um, I worked with servlets quite a bit in industry. If you get it just right, you could do some amazing, highly scalable things. But when it was wrong, when it was poorly deployed, poorly planned, or the nature of your traffic changed, um, very difficult problems to solve, very difficult to even identify the right people to solve the problems. I spent many weekends in inter industry coming in and debugging production for deployment in, in, um, because I you know, I had the expertise knowing Java in the runtime environment that simply my operation support people didn't have because it wasn't how they were trained. Right. So there you go, an overview of, of the evolution of web application architectures, where we are up to, you know, circa, I would say servlets were still predominant as well, their .NET con counterparts, up through 2010 plus. It's really been a transition from 2010 to the present day through Node.js and then through client-centric applications, and that's where this class picks up. So we'll go next. We'll do kind of a transitional recap with a little bit more detail um, on
uh, these technologies in the next presentation, and then we'll go forward from there and get into Node.js and its value proposition um, that it presents as an answer to this kind of evolution to where we are today. Um, and then eventually um, I'll revisit this uh, talk at the beginning of the second half of the class as we get to browser-based architectures and why they're the case. Evolution of web architectures, understanding why that is, what happened, um, pros and cons of it, very important for understanding the context of how we're moving forward with Node.js and browser-based programming.